Following the humiliation of defeat, Germany, between World War I and World War II, was a country that had lost its sense of purpose, its status in the world, had seen revolution and poverty brought about by the Wall Street crash of 1929. By 1933, it was a country that longed for strong leadership that would restore law, order and a sense of identity. One man understood the needs of the German people and presented himself as a saviour in a world that was on the brink of collapse. He knew also how to manipulate the images that the public saw so that he would appear always as a man apart, a man chosen, possessing a monumental, almost magical quality that drew the hopes and trust of the German population. The cameras followed his every move. He fed the popular desire for an invincible symbol of national pride in a way no politician had ever been able to. His rise from a rabble-rouser on the streets of Bavaria to the pinnacle of power in Berlin and conquest of most of Western Europe is one of the most extraordinary and savage stories of our time. Millions of Germans saw in him the messiah he felt himself to be and followed him at first blindly and then under increasing duress into destruction, unable to comprehend that they were simply numbers in his distorted vision of the world dispensable to a man incapable of forming fulfilling personal relationships. One of the most fascinating questions in the history of the 20th century is how did Adolf Hitler come to create a regime that would hold the world in a grip of terror the likes of which had never been seen before? At the time of Adolf Hitler's birth, his mother was staying in an inn, the Gasthof zum Pommer at Braunau am Inn in Austria. He was born at 6.30 in the evening of the 20th of April 1889, the fourth of six children of Alois and Clara Hitler. Alois had been an illegitimate child and had taken his mother's name, Schickelgruber, for the first 39 years of his life. In 1886, he adopted the surname of his stepfather, Johann Georg Hiedler. Clara was his third wife, and only two of the children, Adolf and Paula, survived the difficult early years and lived into adulthood. There was strong affection between them, as she reported later, and bickering. Adolf's father was financially comfortable as he worked for the Imperial Customs Service as a government official. He was devoted to duty, pompous, proud of his status and strict with himself and others. Adolf was frequently beaten by him. I never loved my father, Hitler said later in life, adding unsurprisingly that he was afraid of him and his terrible temper and recalling that he counted silently the blows of the stick once he had resolved never to cry again when being whipped. It is easy to find the boy in the man who would demand unflinching obedience from his new super race. He was not a good student, and despite his father wanting his son to follow his career path as a customs official, Adolf was more interested in art. He was considered lazy, except when reading and talking about his war books. Then his enthusiasm was plain to see. The relationship with his mother was entirely different. She was a kind and devout Roman Catholic who adored and supported her son as he also adored her. In 1903, his father died of a lung hemorrhage. Freed from the long years of parental abuse, he was now no longer able to be disciplined and was expelled from school, which he eventually left aged 16 with no qualifications. 
In 1905, Hitler moved to Vienna to become a painter, living partly on the money given by his mother. He was twice rejected by the Academy of Fine Arts as being untalented and unfit for painting, but with the encouragement that his talents lay in the architectural profession. Despite the bitterness he felt at the refusal, this encouragement gave him a belief in his talent as an architect that stayed with him. And later, his architect Albert Speer became one of his closest advisors. He began to paint pictures from postcards in an attempt to earn his living as an artist to supplement the financial help from his mother. He did sell some of his paintings. When he first arrived in the Austrian capital, Hitler was aged 18. He was overwhelmed by the opulence of the hotels, villas, shops, and the architectural splendor that surrounded him. He went to the opera and the theater. Clara Hitler was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 47, and Adolf stayed by her side during the final stage of the illness. The family doctor said that he had never seen a closer attachment by a son, adding that Adolf Hitler was the saddest man he had ever seen. Clara died just before Christmas 1907. Following the death of his mother, Hitler returned to Vienna, but he was excluded from the life of the city. His mother's death and his own failings sent him into depression, and by 1909 he was walking the streets and sleeping in the open. He finally found shelter living in a men's hostel for the homeless. Whilst he was there, he began to earn a modest income from the sale of his paintings of old Vienna. The society that Hitler aspired to join was ruled over by an aging emperor, Franz Josef, emperor of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He had been on the throne for 60 years and symbolized the divisions of a society where money separated the workers even from the middle classes. Hitler watched street marches taking place as the red flag was carried through Vienna. The sight of these made the young Hitler depressed and he feared for the future. Austria, as part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was also a society where the German population felt under threat by Slavic races. The Catholic Church seemed also to favor the Slavs, with the result that a distrust and dislike for the Catholic religion was widespread amongst Germans. The desire for a united German fatherland was strong. Vienna's population was growing, and amongst the mix of races to be found there was a large Jewish community. Their presence, their strange appearance, caused unease amongst the middle classes. He would not have been alone in sensing dislike of these strange figures with their market stalls, even though he expressed lifelong gratitude to the Jewish doctor, Eduard Bloch, who had tended his mother. By his own account, the more I saw, the more sharply they became distinguished in my eyes from the rest of humanity. Whether Hitler came across the works of the Englishman Houston Stuart Chamberlain in Vienna is uncertain, but his book, The Foundations of the 19th Century, which he wrote in German, was very popular in Germany at the time, which was hardly surprising as Chamberlain maintained that the German race should be dominant in the world. The Germans were, he argued, the most highly gifted of the Aryan group of peoples, and the Aryans are preeminent amongst all peoples, and therefore the lords of the world. He pointed out the racial differences of the Jews, and spoke in derogatory terms of them, warning that racial mixing would mean moral and physical degeneration and the end of Aryan world power. Jews and other racial aliens had to be removed from Germany, he argued. Chamberlain had a particular influence on Alfred Rosenberg, the Nazi's philosopher. Hitler and Goebbels expressed a desire for a cult of race, blood and battle once the final victory had been achieved. His thinking, now thoroughly tainted, sensing himself an outcast, 
Hitler was still in the hostel when, in 1913, he inherited the remaining money from his father's estate and moved to Munich in time to avoid conscription for the imminent First World War. His fierce interest in all things German meant that he did not want to fight for Austria. To many people, the Jews represented the grasping capitalism that brought about poverty and the unfairness of democracy. A war to re-establish the world order seemed desirable. When Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo on June the 28th, 1914, the war everyone wanted was just months away. The Germans mobilized on the 30th of July. Hitler was eagerly ready to fight when World War I hostilities broke out in August. He volunteered to join a Bavarian regiment, the 16th Infantry Reserve Regiment, recording later that he had been gripped with stormy enthusiasm, fallen to his knees with an overflowing heart to thank God for the good fortune of being permitted to live at the time. It was probably bureaucratic oversight that allowed him into the German army. Officially, he should have been returned to Austria as a foreigner. On the 29th of October 1914, Hitler's regiment was engulfed in the battles at Ypres. With 70% losses, his enthusiasm waned. In Mein Kampf, Hitler did not mention that he was in fact a dispatch runner from the first day on and not an infantryman in the trenches. His luck, however, was already in evidence when a shell exploded in the regimental HQ minutes after he had left, almost wiping out the entire staff. His comrades found Hitler strange as he sat for hours in a corner reading or brooding. Despite his lack of humour and the fact that he never joined in with the usual moans or jibes, he generally got on well with those around him. His defence of all things German was fanatical. He would come to passionate life when talking of a new Germany, and his comrades were drawn in as he persuasively described his vision of an Austria reunited with a fatherland in which foreigners and democracy had been removed. Most of his listeners were in agreement. In the 36 battles that he would take part in, he earned a reputation for great personal courage. A senior officer described him as an exceptionally brave, effective and conscientious soldier. He was promoted to Lance Corporal in November 1914 although he was never to progress further because he was not considered to be leadership material by his superior officers, although he did receive the Iron Cross second class that year for rescuing his deputy commanding officer under fire. In late 1916, a shell exploded near the runner's dugout, injuring him in the thigh. The others beside him were also wounded or killed. He spent two months in hospital near Berlin. On a visit to Munich, he was shocked. Morale was low, he wrote later, and every clerk seemed to be a Jew. In 1918, he received the Iron Cross First Class, an award seldom given to a corporal. It was probably not awarded for capturing 15 French soldiers single-handedly, as he claimed later, but for bravery in delivering important dispatches in over four years at the front and even then he had to badger the regimental commander for weeks to get it. During the night of October the 13th, 1918, a mustard gas attack near Ypres partially blinded him. His war was over. During his recovery in northeastern Germany, he learned of capitulation at the front in France and revolution on the German streets. Workers in Berlin had been on strike to protest at the continuing war and against democratic institutions. For him, ending the war was the greatest villainy of the century. Did all this happen so that a bunch of wretched criminals could lay hands on the fatherland, he wrote. The shame of indignation and disgrace burned my brow. Hatred grew in me, hatred for those responsible for this deed. Those responsible were, in his eyes, the politicians of the Democratic Weimar Republic, 
socialists and communists for the industrial strikes in the arms factories, and Jews, who it was said, quite wrongly, had not supported the war. He would later make them all suffer for their assumed treachery. Hitler, along with many others, felt that Germany had been stabbed in the back. The legend of the Dolchstoß was born. Socialists and Bolsheviks agitating for strikes, and especially Jews, were held responsible for the German defeat. The Jews were considered unpatriotic, a claim that was completely unfounded. Hitler wrote, My own fate became known to me, and I decided to go into politics. Hitler had, it seemed, decided that he was the only one able to save Germany. After the war, chaos came to the streets of Germany. Hitler was stunned by what was taking place. Anti-war sentiment and revolution had gripped Germany. The democratically elected Chancellor, Philipp Scheidemann, refused to sign the Treaty of Versailles and resigned. The signing of the treaty finally took place under the Chancellorship of Gustav Bauer on June 28, 1919. When the Kaiser abdicated on November 9, 1918, and fled to Holland, a power vacuum arose, and there was mutiny, fighting in the streets. The unrest was fanned by the Versailles Treaty, and the reparations demanded by the Allies from Germany that kept it financially weak. In Bavaria, the revolutionary fever was at its greatest, with revolutionaries thinking themselves on the edge of a new world order. The Freikorps, paramilitary gangs set up by former army officers and made up of demobbed soldiers, angered at the sudden defeat in the war, were sent to quell the communist unrest, break up the workers' councils and put down risings by communists. The army had taught them that obedience and martial law was the way to ensure stability, and they intended to impose that attitude onto peacetime Germany. Walter Rathenau, foreign minister, was accused by an obscure extreme right-wing party, the German Workers' Party, of being part of a Jewish communist conspiracy, and was assassinated by ultra-nationalist officers. Friedrich Ebert, a social democrat, took over as chancellor, supported by the army and the Freikorps, which now crushed the burgeoning revolution and brought order back to the country. This was an uneasy grip on power, and few people felt loyal to the government. Hitler was 30 when he returned to Munich. The future as a civilian frightened him, and he was open to the influence of the unrest and uncertainty of the post-war era. He managed to stay in the army, only being demobbed on the 31st of March 1920, and he supported the ideals of the Freikorps groupings. Before long, he had been chosen by his army superiors to be a political instructor, and was sent to be trained by the Education and Propaganda Department. His ability to make effective public speeches quickly became apparent, and mindful of this talent, he was sent by the Reichswehr, the German army, to observe and infiltrate the meetings of revolutionary groups. On one of his undercover missions in September 1919, he was sent to listen to an extreme right-wing nationalist group that met in one of the Munich beer cellars. This was the same German Workers' Party that had agitated against Walter Rathenau. Far from decrying them, he agreed with their anti-Semitic nationalist sentiments. Hitler had found his ideological home. On the 12th of September 1919, he gave his first speech to the gathered adherents of the party. Its success can be seen in the fact that he was invited to join the committee. There were perhaps 40 members at the time, and such men as Hitler were always useful. He was a by-product of German history, filled with helpless anger and shame at Germany's degradation, and this angry passion soon swept up his listeners. He had wanted to create a party of his own, but within months Adolf Hitler had ousted the original party founder and was leader of the German Workers' Party. Here he was to meet Hermann Göring and Rudolf Hess, 
two men who stayed loyal to him throughout the lifetime of the Third Reich. Although Hitler suggested the name of the Socialist Revolutionary Party, the name was changed in 1920 to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, the NSDAP. The Nazis had begun their long march to power. Hitler was responsible for the design of the swastika symbol and then for a propaganda newspaper. The photographer Heinrich Hoffmann joined the party in 1920 and Hitler made him official party photographer. He studied the photos Hoffmann took in order to polish his gestures, his inflections, and so perfect the impact of his speeches. These speeches in the beer cellars of Munich drew more and more enthusiastic interest. At this time, Hitler's intention was to bring to power General Ludendorff, a renowned World War I officer. Less than three years after joining the party, it was clear that Hitler was a central figure amongst the Free Corps and German nationalist groupings. And as a result, the NSDAP had been able to recruit thousands of new members. A private army was formed, the SA, who in their brown shirts were organized by the man who would later be their leader, Ernst Röhm. They roamed the streets, breaking up socialist and communist demonstrations, and terrorized Jews. Hitler's popularity was increasing all the time, as was his self-aggrandizement as the savior of the German race. His greed for power was now only matched by his scorn for the others in the movement, who he considered to be reactionaries mired in the past. Anyone who disagreed with him was unceremoniously dispensed with, by violence if necessary. His name was mentioned more often in influential circles in society, and acceptance here fed his aggressive arrogance. Dietrich Eckart, a man who is believed to have influenced Hitler's theories and beliefs, had introduced Hitler to the wealthy in society, people who would later fund the Nazis. Hitler was even given instruction in public speaking while staying with an industrialist sympathizer. He grew in confidence to such an extent that he felt able to stage a coup d'etat in Munich. Many right-wing groups wanted to march on Berlin, echoing Mussolini's march on Rome, and Erich Ludendorff and Hitler were among the enthusiasts for such a move. They had the agreement of Gustav Kahr, the right-wing head of the Bavarian state government, General Losso and Colonel Seiser, who were also part of the government. It was the 9th of November 1923. Together with 600 members of the SA and accompanied by Rudolf Hess, Hermann Göring and Alfred Rosenberg, Hitler burst into the Burger Breu beer hall in Munich, where Gustav Kahr, the Bavarian state commissioner, was giving a speech. A machine gun was set up. A proclamation was issued stating that Hitler, together with General Ludendorff, General Losso and Colonel Seiser, had formed a provisional national government. It was all wildly premature. Jumping onto a table, Hitler fired into the ceiling. Carr had originally supported a coup attempt, but now he withdrew his support. Whilst Göring gave a speech to calm the people in the hall, who were now being prevented from leaving, Hitler and Hess had Carr and the others taken into a side room and demanded they support the coup or be executed. Carr refused to be intimidated. Hitler had him arrested together with Losso and Seisler. Ludendorff finally persuaded them to agree to the putsch and Hitler left the building. Ludendorff then released his captives who lost no time in arranging to put down the coup attempt. Next day, with the government gathering its forces, fighting broke out. Hitler asked for help from Crown Prince Ruprecht of Bavaria as a mediator and ordered the arrest of the Bavarian city council as hostages. Ruprecht said later that he thought Hitler to be insane. Hitler realized that the putsch was failing. He had no answer to the problem. It was Ludendorff who shouted out, Wir marschieren! We are going to march!
Röhm and Hitler's men, some 2,000 in total, marched along the street with no particular aim until Ludendorff once again took charge and led them to the Bavarian Defence Ministry. At Odiensplatz, in front of the Feldherrenhalle, they met 100 soldiers blocking their way. Then the firing broke out. Max Erwin von Scheubner Richter, who had made the detailed plans for the coup and had linked arms with Hitler, was shot in the lungs and died instantly as Hitler and the others walked towards the police. Hitler said later that he had been the only irreplaceable loss that day and devoted the first part of Mein Kampf to his associate. Panicked by the bullets and the death of Richter, Hitler fled. Ludendorff continued to walk into the fire. He lived to be put on trial. Even up to his death in 1937, he never wanted anything to do with Hitler again, considering him a coward for running away. Both Goering and Hitler were injured, but Goering was able to escape whilst Hitler was arrested. Goering suffered bullet wounds to his leg and became increasingly dependent on morphine for the rest of his life. In prison, Hitler became so severely depressed that his friends had to try and persuade him not to commit suicide. He was to be tried for treason and he decided to use the opportunity to speak to the world outside of the courtroom. He would stand up for his beliefs and for himself as saviour of the fatherland. He would do what he was to become famous for, attack. In terms of his future as a politician, his scheme worked better than he could have hoped. Reported in the newspapers, he was acclaimed and lauded, and Ludendorff was subsequently ousted from leadership of the party. This episode in his later life served wonderfully in maintaining the myth of his past, and each year a victory parade was held and a wreath laid in honour of the 16 men who had died during the abortive coup. The five-year prison sentence handed down to him by a judge sympathetic to his cause proved to be a lame façade. He was given comfortable rooms, good food and allowed to wear his own clothes. In Landsberg jail he had the time to forge his plans for the future and he wrote them out in a book, Mein Kampf, My Struggle. Dictated to his deputy in the party and fellow inmate Rudolf Hess, Mein Kampf sets out Hitler's ideology of anti-Semitism, belief in the master race, and the idea that some men are destined to be rulers and others to be ruled, together with his belief in Lebensraum, space in which to live in the east of Europe and especially Russia, and of course the necessity to overthrow the Treaty of Versailles. Hess had introduced Hitler to the political geography theories of Karl Haushofer, having been his scientific assistant. Haushofer promoted the ideas of German expansion, Lebensraum, not by claiming colonies outside of Europe, but by claiming land in the East, where, he said, Germany's destiny lay. In prison, Hitler came across eugenics. This theory put forward the idea of improving the human race by selective breeding. 
the final important cornerstone of Nazi ideology was in place. The failed putsch had changed his mind on violent revolutionary change. If the German people wanted legal change, then, although this would take longer, that is what he would give them. He realized that if he were to reject revolution as the path to power, he needed to make the National Socialist Party known throughout the country. After just eight months, he was a free man. Following his release, Hitler spent his time at Obersalzberg, the mountainous area above Bechtesgaden near Munich, forgotten as a politician far from the power he craved, as the Weimar Republic stabilized and brought a new sense of hope to the German people. It also brought in a new age and new culture that he despised. Berlin, now enjoying its heyday, was the epicenter of all that he loathed. Communist agitation, Jews, and everywhere he bitterly noted jazz. His niece Gailey provided him with some distraction, and they had a brief affair during which time Hitler's jealous possessiveness of her became pathological and led to him controlling her so tightly she was virtually a prisoner. She was found dead in Hitler's apartment, but whether her death by shooting was suicide or not remains a mystery. Hitler had to rebuild his party and began as he had ended before the coup with propaganda. Some states had banned him from speaking and he used this fact to his advantage displaying the clever use of propaganda that helped bring him power and that he later used shamelessly to cover his real intentions and heap blame and falsehoods on others. The man who was to become one of his most loyal supporters and take Nazi propaganda to new heights came into contact with the party in 1923 and joined in 1924. His name was Josef Goebbels, and he remained with Hitler until the very end in the Berlin bunker in 1945. He too misjudged Hitler at the start. With us in the West, wrote Goebbels, there can be no doubt. First socialist redemption, then comes national liberation like a whirlwind. Hitler stands between both opinions, but he is on his way to coming over to us completely. Hitler did not. Goebbels was appalled and disillusioned that Hitler saw socialism as a Jewish creation, maintaining that the Jews were the real problem, not the capitalists. But in a show of his abilities to persuade, Hitler, who greatly valued Goebbels' talents, won him over completely in a private conversation. Now Goebbels found a sparkling mind that he could follow, a political genius who had thought through everything. Hitler was both simple and great at the same time, he wrote, and he who forsakes the Führer will wither away. The abortive coup attempt had taught Hitler to grope his way to power more quietly and avoid violent confrontations with the state. So he presented himself as a law-abiding member of society clothed in sober dark suits, a man who cared for the future of the country and therefore its children. His aim was now to persuade rather than force, and as he began his work on the Germans, he began his work on himself. His appearances were not yet as smooth as they were to become later nor did he yet possess the authority he wished for. But within three years, the National Socialist Party was showing the tight organization for which it would become renowned. More and more local groups were formed and, with an eye to the future, it was the youngsters that came in for his particular attention. Excitement, friendship, status within a strong group, paired with discipline and a life outside of the restrictions within the family, all appealed to the German boys. Some two-thirds of the Sturmabteilung, the SA, were under 30 years old. 
Even those who were not connected to Hitler's minority party found it hard not to be impressed by the rigorous organization and determination of the National Socialists. The festival atmosphere of colour and music with flags everywhere was reminiscent of the era of the Kaiser. Slowly Hitler expanded his power base. President Ebert had died in 1925. The conservative First World War hero, Paul Hindenburg, was his successor. He was later to allow Hitler into power and was not the first, nor would he be the last, to believe that Corporal Hitler could be controlled by those who knew what government was about. In 1929, America came to Hitler's aid. The Wall Street crash plunged Germany into deep recession. This was where the National Socialists scored points. They did not spend all their time haranguing those in power. They cleverly offered a sense of identity, of community, of optimism. They organized self-help programs, work pools and soup kitchens. Their reasoning and solutions seemed more and more acceptable to Germans struggling to survive. Their status grew and so did the numbers of members as the numbers of those unemployed soared to 3 million in 1930 and up to 6 million by 1931. Hitler knew that he could turn events to his favour. He publicly expressed concern for the hardship whilst trying to keep the situation unstable through his SA thugs. In Berlin, where Josef Goebbels was now Gauleiter, or head of a Nazi district, the National Socialists were targeting the communist areas of the city. Ernst Thälmann, seen here, was leader of the communists. Riots and fighting were almost continuous with injuries and fatalities every week. The Weimar Republic fought back, but with war reparations still being demanded by the Allies, its authority and ability to control the situation was weakening rapidly. When Gustav Stresemann, foreign minister, died in 1929, there was no longer anyone strong enough to withstand the pressure. Hitler and his party were seen by German industrialists as a means to counteract the threat of communism. Someone needed to turn the masses against the socialist movements and for the factory owners, Hitler was the man for the job. Money was given in support so that the agitation and threatening demonstrations of strength by the SA could continue. The new Chancellor, Heinrich Brüning, introduced unpopular measures to try and tackle the social problems. His measures were rejected by the Reichstag Parliament, and Hindenburg, a traditionalist whose sympathies always lay with the right, felt that this was a failure of Parliament and decided on new elections. It was a fatal decision. In the 1930 elections for the Reichstag, the Nazis won 18.3% of the vote and became the second largest party. 
more and more people saw in Hitler what he saw in himself, the savior of Germany. Support for his party grew. The middle classes were drawn to him through fear of communism and his vision of a strong Germany. The party of the right, led by Alfred Hugenberg, wanted to annex Hitler's popularity for themselves and a joint rally was organized at Bad Harzburg in autumn 1931. It misfired and Hitler used it for his own aggrandizement. He was not prepared to compromise. He wanted power, but on his terms and for himself alone. He was not beholden to business for funds. He was not open to negotiation. In court cases involving his supporters, this was the line he always followed, change by constitutional means. The lawyer Hans Frank, who later became governor general of occupied Polish territories, was always at hand to help Hitler. Hitler also took out German citizenship to enable him to become a candidate for the presidency. In 1932, he undertook a propaganda tour of seven towns which he visited by air over seven days. That year there were five elections. Hitler used all the means available to him to undermine democracy and with no other party able to promulgate a stronger vision of Germany's future as Hitler, he was becoming unstoppable. That year his image seemed to be omnipresent and his speeches eagerly listened to. It seemed that he already was the leader of the country. The National Socialists certainly became the most powerful party in Germany, as Hitler emphasized again and again that he was one of the people. He had been through the hardships himself, and because of that, the future was going to be different. How different was already plain to anyone who wanted to listen. Always returning to the people as the linchpin of society, he offered a world free of class. Kurt von Schleicher inadvertently helped Hitler on his way to power. He bore a large part of the responsibility for bringing down the Brüning Chancellorship, and when his successor, Franz von Papen of the Centre Party, was forced to resign, Schleicher was appointed Chancellor, having formed a close relationship with President Hindenburg but his willingness to work with the socialist parties annoyed Hindenburg. Papen, still seeking power, held secret meetings with Hitler and Hindenburg, and the president refused Schleicher's request for emergency powers and dismissed him. For advocating a return to the monarchy of the Hohenzollern family, Schleicher had become a target for assassination in Hitler's eyes, and he had Schleicher shot and murdered together with his wife during the Night of the Long Knives on the 30th of June 1934. The government could do nothing to prevent the wave of sympathy for Hitler as discontent on the streets was countered by the police. Authority waned, Hitler and his cohorts waited for their chance.
Just now, at the moment they were poised for power, President Hindenburg rejected Hitler's demand for the chancellorship, and there were rumblings of discontent in the party hierarchy. And as Hitler never cared to be restricted by finances, the party was in debt. But the turnaround was swift. Businessmen paid off the party's debts, and following the election of November the 6th, 1932, in which the National Socialists lost seats, Franz von Papen had persuaded President Hindenburg that Hitler could be controlled in government and should be given the chancellorship. The National Socialists had three ministerial posts, the Conservatives eight. It was a fatal decision that brought about the collapse of the Weimar Republic and the end of democracy. The Machtergreifung, the seizure of power, was complete. On the 30th of January 1933, Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. His supporters celebrated on the streets. Germany felt the change was coming. There was not long to wait. As a triumphant Hitler and a failing Hindenburg showed themselves to the crowds, the SA were already attacking their enemies. Here, Hitler attends a funeral for an SA man who died during the fighting during that first night. As usual, death was more interesting to Hitler and his cause than life. Ludendorff was horrified by Hitler's rise to power. A telegram that he was reported to have sent to Hindenburg read, by appointing Hitler Chancellor of the Reich, you have handed over our sacred German fatherland to one of the greatest demagogues of all time. I prophesy to you this evil man will plunge our Reich into the abyss and will inflict immeasurable woe on our nation. Future generations will curse you in your grave for this action. Hitler, always with one eye on the propaganda potential of the old general, later tried bribery to win him over and was sent away empty-handed by an enraged Ludendorff. Within a week, there was a clampdown on the opposition parties with left-wing meetings banned. Even moderates were assaulted and threatened. By mid-February, the Communist Party had been suppressed and members of the Reichstag arrested. Hitler's first speech as Chancellor was given on February the 10th. Volkes 
Wenn wir selbst dieses deutsche Volk ein Vorführen zur eigenen Arbeit, zur eigenen Fleisch, eigenen Entschlossenheit, eigenen Trotz, eigenen Beharrlichkeit, dann werden wir wieder den Vorstein, genau wie die Väter einst aus Deutschland nicht der Stelz erhielten, sondern selbst den schaffen mussten. On the 27th of February, the Reichstag went up in flames, with the blaze destroying the Great Hall, and the Nazis had the excuse they needed for the first stage in the crushing of the democratic state. The communists were blamed for the fire. A Dutchman, Marinus van der Lubbe, was arrested for arson and found guilty at his trial and executed by guillotine the following year. Three others accused with him were acquitted. One of those was Georgi Dimitrov, a Bulgarian who calmly told the court that Goering and the Nazis had been behind the fire. After the fire, Goering was reported to have boasted that he had arranged the arson attack and later confessed that he had drawn up a list of those to be arrested even before the fire took place. After the fire, other communists were arrested and murdered and constitutional rights suspended under the Reichstag fire decree. Under its terms, personal freedoms were suspended, house searches and seizure of property made legal. Within two weeks, some 10,000 arrests had taken place in Prussia alone. This was martial law in all but name. Ernst Thälmann, leader of the Communist Party, was one of those arrested. Thälmann, after 11 years of solitary confinement, was taken to Buchenwald where, in 1944, Hitler gave the order for him to be shot. The last hurdle for Hitler was the forthcoming election of March the 5th, 1933. The brown shirts were on the streets to intimidate the voters and state radio ordered to broadcast Hitler's speech from Königsberg. 50,000 members of the SS, SA and Stahlhelm were sent to monitor the voting in Prussia. The results were disappointing. 43.9% of the votes went to Hitler, 17 million people. This meant that the Papen-Hitler coalition had just a 16-seat majority. On the 21st of March 1933, the new Reichstag met in Potsdam at the Garrison Church where Frederick the Great was buried. Hindenburg also attended, unaware, as were most onlookers, of what was really happening. A relic from a bygone age, he lent to Hitler the aura of the great German heroes from the past. It was a soothing sight to those who were tired of the struggles. The SA and army marched along the same route, symbolic of the old and new regimes. But no socialist or communist parliamentarians were invited. The worst of the nightmare had not even begun. Rückblickend wieder einmal des heutigen Tages gedenkt, erinnert euch dieser meiner Meinung. In diesem Willen lasst uns zusammenrufen, Deutschland, unser geliebtes Vaterland. Hurra!
Next day, trade union offices were stormed. The terror had been unleashed. On March the 23rd, Hitler was speaking to the Reichstag to push through a piece of legislation that would lay another stone on the path to his dictatorship. This was the Enabling Act, which would give the cabinet, and therefore Hitler himself, authority to enact laws without referring to the Reichstag parliament. To make sure that Hitler got his way, the SS and SA surrounded the Kroll Opera House, which was where the Reichstag was now meeting. Göring, who was president of the Reichstag, ruled that any absent deputy would be considered as present. In this way, he ensured the presence of two-thirds of the total number of members that was required for the vote, and it was impossible for socialist SPD members to boycott the proceedings as planned. But whilst Hitler was still trying to keep the image of adhering to the constitutional rules upright, his SA men under Röhm were simply deposing the state governments and occupying buildings as they did in Munich on the 9th of March. Hitler had finally been able to exact his revenge for the failed coup of 1923. The Gleichschaltung, the coordination of all aspects of German life so that tight control could be exercised over every citizen, was not only seen in the laws being swiftly enacted, but in the organizations such as the World War I veterans Stahlhelm, steel helmet, which was integrated into the SA and finally dissolved in 1935. The unions were crushed in May, when leaders were imprisoned and the unions merged with the German Workers' Front, which all workers were forced to join. As yet, the Jews were unharmed, but on April the 1st, 1933, Jewish doctors, lawyers and businesses were subjected to an official boycott. Then, on May the 10th, as bonfire flames curled around the books of Thomas Mann, Sigmund Freud and many others in every town that had a university, Goebbels spoke in Berlin. Um diese mitternächtige Stunde, den Ungeist der Vergangenheit, den Flammen anzuvertrauen. It would only be a matter of time before other fires would burn. There where they burn books, said the 19th century German Jewish writer Heinrich Heine, human beings will finally burn too. Einstein, theatre director Max Reinhardt, Thomas Mann and many others who understood what the Nazis intended emigrated. Germany was left in the stranglehold of the barbarians. <laughs> 